morning, everyone. Um, well, it's good to see everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here and have this opportunity to share a message. I chose this topic of humility because it's, uh, it's something I actually think about a lot. Uh, almost on a daily basis, believe it or not. And I evaluate myself about how far I've come in my own quest to become a truly humble person. So I'd like to um, just share the points that I'm going to cover today. Of course, being a teacher, I like things uh, nice and orderly. So here basically, the, uh, this is our journey today, the six points. First, we're going to just cover the origin and definition of the actual word. We're going to explore, second, some of the different religious traditions. We're going to look at the Christian tradition, then the unification perspective, and I'd like to share a little bit of personal experience. And number six, which in the homiletics class is called the call to action, how do we practice humility in our daily lives? I feel a little awkward with the uh, mic, so I will overcome that. So, I'm sharing this image of a boulder, is, uh, that's kind of like if I look back at myself when I began my spiritual journey, um, I was thick, I was really thick. And uh, there is a, a machine, um, it's like a giant, almost looks like a cement mixer, and you can put rocks in there, and you can uh, twirl them around and around and around, and over time they break up. And so the rocks can be broken down over time into fine sand. And I love this analogy because I feel like um, on my own spiritual journey, I'm sifting through, I'm breaking down, God's breaking me down when I'm open to him to become from this thick boulder to that pure, beautiful sand. So I feel like humility is kind of overlooked, uh, maybe underestimated, maybe overlooked. And I was talking to Greg about my topic. He used the term. I'll give you credit here, Greg. He said it's underutilized. And so I would have to agree with that. I think humility is often um, underutilized. I believe that humility is in a different category from the other virtues because it's the basic foundation of our spiritual life. So uh, the point of this sermon is to explain and expand upon this idea. So, if we go through the origin and definition of the actual word humility, um, the word humility originated from the early 14th century. From in the old French, it was humilité. I don't know if I pronounce that right. Meaning humility, modesty, or sweetness. And in the Latin, it was humilitatem, or in the nominative, humilitas, meaning lowness or insignificance. And in the Church Latin, in the uh, Catholic liturgy. Humilis is translated as humble, and it can be also translated as grounded from the earth or low. And it derives from the word hummus, meaning from the earth. Dictionary.com defines humility as the modest opinion or estimate of one's own ability. Merriam-Webster defines humility as the quality or state of not thinking that you're better than other people, the quality or state of being humble. In uh, children's literature, there's a famous book, Charlotte's Web, and uh, in that book, there's a really sweet-natured pig, Wilbur, who has to fight for his life because he's destined to end up as a Christmas ham, and Charlotte the spider comes to his rescue, writing messages in the web. And the final message was that Wilbur is humble, which actually saved his life. So now I'm going to take a look at some of the different traditions and see how they thread together. Uh, Judaism, in Judaism, um, Rabbi Sachs states that in Judaism, humility is an appreciation of oneself, one's talents, skills, and virtues. It's not meekness or self-deprecating thought, but the effacing of oneself to something higher. Humility is not to think lowly of oneself, but to appreciate the self one has received. So one becomes humble to the awesomeness one is, 
and what one can achieve. Um, Rabbi Dunner states that Moses wrote in the Torah, so Moses wrote this about himself, and Moses was exceedingly humble, more than any man on the face of the earth. So Moses wrote about himself that he was the most humble. And that certainly seems like a contradiction, right? So how is it possible to be humble and to write that you are the most humble? The conclusion is that Moses knew he was humble. So it's not the denial of your talents and gifts, but to recognize them and live up to your worth and something greater. So it's in the service to others that's the greatest form of humility. So in Moses, who leads the nation of Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land, humility was a sign of godly strength and purpose. Um, if we look at the book of Islam, in the Quran, the Arabic words which convey the meaning of humility are used. And actually the word Islam itself can be interpreted to mean surrender to God, humility. Um, there's a quote from the Quran, successful indeed are the believers, those who humble themselves in their prayers. In Buddhism, the aim of the Buddhist life is the state of enlightenment, which is gradually cultivated through meditation and other practices, other spiritual practices. But in this way, humility is both a part of the practice and the end result. In Hinduism, the virtue of humility is explained in the concept of a manatam, which means pridelessness. So one interpretation of Atmanabham as virtue is that humility means one should not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others. The material conception of life makes us very eager to receive honor from others. But the point of view of a man in perfect knowledge who knows he's not of this body, anything pertaining to the body is useless. So Gandhi interprets the concept of humility in Hinduism broadly, where humility is an essential virtue that must exist in the person for the other spiritual virtues to emerge. So to Gandhi, truth and love can be cultivated, but humility cannot be cultivated. Humility has to be one of the starting points. So this is a, a quote from Gandhi. Humility must not be confused with mere manners. A man may prostrate himself before another, but if his heart is full of bitterness for the other, it's not humility. Sincere humility is how one feels inside a state of mind. A humble person is not himself conscious of his humility. And this is actually the same point that C.S. Lewis made in his book, Mere Christianity. Do not imagine if you met a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who's always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think of him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. So in uh, Taoism, along with compassion and frugality, humility is one of the three treasures or virtues of those who follow the way or follow the Tao. Um, here are my three treasures. Guard and keep them. The first is pity. The second, frugality. The third, refusal to be foremost of all things under heaven. For only he that pities is truly able to be brave. Only he that is frugal is able to be profuse. Only he that refuses to be foremost of all things is truly able to become the chief of all ministers. So to be a truly good leader, you have to be truly humble. Now, if we look at the Native American religions, the Sioux tradition says the lamenter. The lamenter is the person who's seeking the vision, cries. 
for he's humbling himself, remembering his nothingness in the presence of the great spirit. So we can see a common thread throughout all of these traditions. And I think we can take, uh, we can take gems from all of them. So if we look at the Christian tradition, humility is a basic foundation of spiritual life. Now there's actually something significant in this, in this image. Instead of the God-man Jesus being all-powerful and all-encompassing, he's a baby. He's under his mother's protection, which is actually starting out significant, showing his humility. So St. Augustine said, humility is the foundation of all the other virtues. Hence, in the soul in which this virtue does not exist, there cannot be any other virtue except in mere appearance. So without humility, we cannot practice the other virtues. So in a state of humility, we're living in the truth, knowing who we are, nothing more, nothing less. So if we think of ourselves as higher than we are, we're deceiving ourselves, and then we're not living in the truth. Um, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux was a um, mystic from the 12th century who offered a lot of wisdom, and he also spoke a lot about humility. He said, humility is the knowledge of self. We know the truth about ourselves, our weaknesses, fears, sins, and insecurities, and yet, we acknowledge our good qualities. There's a profound understanding that those good qualities do not come from me, they come from God, and come from the people God has placed in my life and in the circumstances he's given me. When we see how truly dependent on God we are, we see ourselves as we really are. We acutely feel our weaknesses. There's no pretending, no false airs. We're dependent on God for everything. So uh, we can see throughout God's providence that God can do great things with the humble soul. So I love this image of our true father praying on the mountain. We could say he is essentially, he, is hum he humbled himself to God's will and to the direction Jesus gave him. And then, of course, that has made all the difference to all of us. So there are many Christian models of humility, um, St. Paul, Mother Teresa, St. Therese, St. Francis of Assisi, and they had some of the qualities they had, uh, they were bold and daring, and they gave themselves totally to carrying out the will of God, but their confidence was not based on their own abilities, but rather on relying completely on God. Jesus Christ um, taught about humility, one of his uh, famous parables, is the Pharisee and the tax collector, and the parable goes like this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So Jesus Christ was an example of humility. So now I want to share a little about the unification perspective. Um, I expected to see the word humble or humility scattered all throughout the divine principle. But when I went to the index, there was only one reference, and that was on page 205. In the section on lessons from Noah's family, it reads, we too need humility, obedience, and patience to walk the path toward heaven. All right, even if the word humility is not used, the concept is of course throughout the divine principle and in the life and words of our true parents, humility and being humble are implicit. For example, 
In the Garden of Eden, the Archangel Lucifer could not be humble. He sought to be higher than he was. Throughout the Providence, heaven, our Heavenly Parent works through men and women who have humility, who are able to humble themselves before um, Heavenly Parent. Reverend and Mrs. Moon, our true parents, exemplify humility. Our true father said, if you stay in a low position and try to put everyone else in a higher position, no walls will block your way. Um, we can see their humility in their prayers. Our true father prayed, Father, let this be the hour when we allow absolutely nothing of ourselves. Let us rejoice only where we have been grafted onto the Father. We cannot help but appeal to the Father with all our hearts now. These humble people have knelt down this day in honor of the heavenly emotion. Our true father often spoke of the high noon of absolute values. So when we stand in the sun at high noon, we stand in the sun at high noon, we cast no shadow. A world, a world governed by the heavenly way and the heavenly laws is a natural world, an unobstructed world of truth and pure reason. It is at the high noon of absolute values without any dark shadows. So I see that a person with humility, a truly humble person, casts no shadow. We see ourselves as, I tr as we truly are, nothing more, nothing less, and we embody those absolute values. And we're leading a life that's vertically aligned with heaven such that no shadow is cast. So if I share a little bit of my personal experience, I honestly think the reason I think about humility so much is that it took me a long time to recognize how arrogant I really am. So I was raised in a family that was better off materially than most. And this translated into me, and I think most of the members of my family, feeling better than others. We felt that we were, well, we were better off, but it also was like a quality. We felt we were better. And it was quite eye-opening for me to discover later that um, actually I was not better than others. And it was, it's, a, it's been a path to actually go from the recognition of that on the um, intellectual level to work to bring it to the artistic level. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, many of us uh, more mature members spent time on uh, doing public service on the MFT, which was Mobile Fundraising Team. And uh, we were raising funds for our church activities. And we were kind of like, I guess you would call missionaries, lay missionaries. And we devoted ourselves to the, to the cause. And we, for a certain period of time, we would work to raise money for our activities. So during that time, for me, I had the chance to um, kind of come face to face with myself by meeting people, many people that I considered truly humble. Um, one experience I remember, I was fundraising in a very poor section in Baltimore. I was going door to door in an apartment building that was part of a housing project. At one apartment, there was a little old lady who welcomed me in and talked with me about what I was doing. And she radiated such a loving spirit and wanted to give me every bit of money that she had on hand. And I really didn't even want to take it because I could see she had so little, um, but she insisted. So it was just a few dollars, but I knew that was like the widow's mind. That was all she had. So of course, um, I felt so richly blessed, but I also felt weighted down by my own ego because I was thinking I'm connected I've accepted true parents. I'm following the way of true parents. And yet, this woman will surely be in heaven before me <laughs> because I saw where her heart was. And I met many people like that. And it was a very humbling experience. So I also have to say, I'm, I'm so grateful I could have that kind of experience. Because without that kind of experience, and that's the whole image of the boulder rubbing down, I, I couldn't have changed. How would it have changed? Because I would have had a very good station in life I would have ultimately, my destiny in my family was to marry a naval officer, uh, was high ranking, and to live a good life. But I don't think I would have had the chance to really um, see myself as I really was. So, the question then, how do we gain humility in our lives? So, 
As unificationists, we are seeking to live a life in which we reflect the heart of Heavenly Parent in our everyday living. So in order to do that, we need, um, we need a heart of, of repentance. We need a heart of humility, a heart of gratitude, a heart of compassion, a heart of forgiveness, and a heart of sacrificial love. Humility goes hand in hand with love and compassion. So without the heart and the compassion, it's not possible to behave in a humble manner. So in order to be able to substantiate compassion and sacrificial love, which go hand in hand, we need to begin each day with repentance. Um, repent for the four fallen natures. Repent for ancestral fallen nature that we don't have any control over. Repentance, repent for bad habits we have. Repent for our inability to change our, ourselves. Repent for our inability to embrace Heavenly Parent's heart. And repent for our inability to fulfill Heavenly Parent's providence. So we shouldn't repent only from our mind, but from our heart united with our mind. And our heart, our heart is of course connected to our true parent, to our Heavenly Parent. We can find our heart by delving into our emotions. Now, our emotions, our emotions may be or can be chaotic. So if our emotions are chaotic and God is a God of order, we can't relate. And this is where repentance comes in. We have to repent for those aspects of ourselves that are not of Heavenly Parent. And after repenting, we can be grateful and have that heart of humility. So how do we get humility? We need a repenting heart in order for humility to exist within us. So um, I will continue on this road of humility, on my own spiritual path, and seeking to break down that original boulder and to become this fine, beautiful sand. So <laughs> as we walk, I walk the road to humility, we'll have the strength to fulfill what we've been called to do. So this is the call to action. <laughs> <laughs> I'll end with this quote from our true father we must be humble we must initiate from this moment the greatest movement ever on earth the environment to bring God back home in your homes, your churches, your schools and your national life our work for God's purpose must begin let's make God's presence in America a living reality so please join me in prayer